तमो तस् भगवत अर्हत संबुद्ध The subject of the discourse today is two extremes. Dwe anta. Now this is the fourth in the series on Dhamma Chakka Bhavatana Sutta we have been discussing. Today's is the uh, fourth one. So far we have discussed on the the eight. लोक धम्मा और द द एट वर्ली कंडीशंस द कंडीशंस दैट आर इनहेरेंट इन लाइफ एंड इन द वर्ल्ड द टू पेयर्स ऑफ ऑपोजिट्स एंड देन आई हैव आल्सो मेंशन अबाउट हाउ अशोका ही इज वॉर्ड फेयर एंड हाउ दिस लोक धम्मास यू से His understanding of Loka Dharma transformed him. So today we want to discuss another very vital point on this sutta. That is, just as the eight Loka Dharmas are intrinsic in life, you can't avoid them. Gain and loss, happiness and misery, praise and blame, these are part and parcel of life. You just can't help it. but by cultivating wise reflection on the nature of these one can go beyond them even if gain were to come one will not be affected by gain but one will make use of gain for betterment of life for oneself and for others around oneself now so just as these dichotomies the dualities of life can be turned into spiritual tools even so what the anta the extremes that we are going to discuss today can be made use of for spiritual growth indeed they are very vital they have to be used now what are these extremes i will read out portion of the uh, pali text and then explain but uh, before we go into the text proper just as the eight dualities are part and parcel of life so feelings there are three feelings that are very uh, that are part and parcel of life yes. we come with that as we are born we are reborn with that we just can't run away from that at all now these three uh, feelings are very common you know you are experiencing it all the time now these three feelings are the feel so manasa in pali which simply means uh, a joyous feeling a feeling of happiness joyful feeling a pleasant feeling an agreeable feeling and so on as opposed to that is do manasa a kind of depressed feeling and unhappiness not joyful but depressed unhappy unpleasant disagreeable feeling now these are the two opposites then there is the middle the uh, neutral feeling or rather the equanimous feeling or the feeling of impartiality madhyastha bhavam madhyartha bhav that is a balance of mind a kind of balanced feeling both the two uh, extreme feelings are are transcended one is a one has cultivated the mind in such a way that one can go beyond both and remain in a state of impartiality and calm and completely equanimous now for spiritual development that is the attitude that is vital and important and that has to be cultivated that will not just come 
is not a is not something that comes automatically. No, is there the three feelings are there all the time and uh, they are conditioned in the sense when the certain conditions are present, a certain feeling will be present. That's all. You see an object in the eye. We have got these five. Um, uh, you see rupa, corporeality or material senses, the eye, the ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, the immaterial, the mental field, mental uh, faculty. Now these are senses as well as faculties. Faculty means controlling power, something that has controlling power. It, it, can, it has the power to control. So, now, these six senses that we have and we are in touch with the world through these six senses because they are the doors. They are the doors that open up the world, the external world, to our internal world of mind. If there is I, there is a counterpart of I in the external world, namely visible objects. If there is ear, the sense of ear, there is the, uh, the counterpart sound. If there is nose, the counterpart is smell. There is tongue, the counterpart being taste, the flavor and the taste that you taste. And similarly, body, the counterpart being touch. These five senses, corporeal senses, bodily senses, as well as the mental sense, the mind. Now, these six senses are doors, and they are the external world is sort of re received through these in the form of the, they are direct objects, aramana, the objects for the eye, visible object, etc. So when the visible object is in contact with the eye, you see, immediately the visible object, you see, when it is in contact, it has an impact on the mind in the form will say either you like it or you dislike it. It is a pleasant feeling or an unpleasant feeling or a painful feeling. So pleasure and pain are feelings that are, you see, that come in through the senses. So that these feelings are there from birth. And how that will be discussed as we proceed in the, uh, during this, uh, you know, series. Here, the Avidhamma aspect of uh, Buddhism, we will go into that also, bit by bit. So now, uh, this incoming uh, sense impressions and the mental impressions, you see, now, they uh, bring in this mental factor or experience called feeling. And feeling has such profound effect on the mind and on life as a whole. It has indeed very, very profound uh, uh, impact on life. That is why a part of spiritual training, very important training, it deals with the mind, with the feeling. Vedana Anusati, for instance, as a foundation of mindfulness, feeling can be turned into a foundation for developing mindfulness and thereby developing the mind itself. And all the potentials, virtues and wisdom and knowledge, all these that are inherent in mind. All this can be uh, cultivated through this, cultivating the feeling. So the role of feeling is very, very great indeed. 
So like the, the pair of opposites or the dualities that I have already discussed, this intrinsic inborn quality of feeling or sensation, from sense you have the word sensation, you sense it, you experience it. They experience what? Experience the external world in the form of sight, in the form of sound, in the form of uh, smell, in the form of taste, etc. And touch. And the mental objects, the concepts, the ideas, etc. Now, these incoming uh, objects of the external world or the internal world of mind, mental, they, you see, they rule, they govern life. If you are a spiritual seeker and you meditate regularly and you don't allow the mind to wander wherever it wishes and then get lost in the jungle of the past or in the jungle of the future, never in reality. So once we allow the mind to roam about like that, and then you have completely lost control over yourself, life has no meaning. And that is just what most people have. No meaning. They don't know why they are living. They don't know their goals, their objectives of life. And because they don't know themselves, therefore they don't know the goals of their life. And once they don't know both, life is just, you know, in the wilderness, meaningless. So Lord Buddha in his, the ocean of compassion that he was, in his boundless compassion, discovered the way by which this feeling itself, which is a completely uh, is, um, uh, impressions the mind, this very feeling which keeps the mind in a state of uh, servility. This very feeling can be also a tool for freedom. And he has discovered it and made known to us to be able to discover ourselves and be free, liberated from the sufferings of early existence. Now, the feelings. Normally, these feelings are they have such, uh, uh, I mean, tremendous impact on our minds, on our lives. See, we are not aware of them all the time. So, but get willy nearly caught by them. Now, for instance, there is the pursuit of pleasure. There is also the pursuit of pain. You develop a kind of mind self-righteous mind through the so-called penances, so-called self-mortification, torture yourself in the name of religion, in the name of this, in the name of that. You go and shoot yourself and say, oh, I'm going to, uh, going to God by killing a hundred people with a bomb, all strapped around your, around your body. This type of the you now feeling monger, these are all feeling mongers who are so much in love with themselves that they want to destroy themselves. So how do they do that? By this pain, do, do manasa. They make use of this pain as a means, you see, uh, to uh, turn themselves into martyrs.
they become martyrs. There are men and women, particularly young ones, uh, they love to be, you see, to indulge in martyrdom. So pain can also be a tool for this, uh, you see, this self-destruction. Just as pleasure can be a tool for self-destruction. And one should understand, therefore, the nature of these, both pain and uh, pleasure, uh, painful and pleasurable feelings. We'll go into this uh, in some detail, but generally speaking. So these two feelings, they create pursuit. That means you take up this as a, a whole uh, be-all and end-all of life. Your life is just, that's the be, that's the end. You are caught up in that all the time. Now you can see, uh, I am sure all of you news, uh, read all these newspapers and all. I am not, of course, very much come in touch with these things now. But I come to here once in a way. See, people in the so-called advanced stage countries, they have developed so much of greed for eating, particularly these young girls in these colleges and schools, some of them I have seen. They gorge themselves all the time. Eating, 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 every blessed thing on earth they must eat. They live to eat. They don't, you see, eat to live. No. They live to eat. That's their life. And why young? Even the older fellows are no less. So you take eating as a pursuit of feeling, or a pleasurable feeling. Ask yourself, my dears. Be honest to yourself. Just be straightforward to yourself. Forget about the world. Are you not a slave to your tongue? Have you asked yourself? Do you not love to eat? Do you not have likes and dislikes based upon your taste for food, your taste bud, your tongue? As a spiritual seeker whose life is dedicated to the pursuit of enlightenment which Buddha undertook under Bhagavan Deepankara billions of lives years ago and became a Buddha, a supremely enlightened one with an all-knowing mind, omniscient one became the, you see, the spiritual master of both gods and men. Now, Buddha became a Buddha by understanding feelings. How the feeling of this pursuit of pleasure or the pursuit of pain, you see, can change life, either this way or that way. So very, uh, two, uh, um, the pursuit of pleasure in two ways are absolutely uh, very, very powerful indeed. One is the tongue and the other is the body. Body is the sex urge that captivates the mind totally. And one is slave to it. Totally. So this feeling has such overwhelming power. Exercise through, you see, the bodily sense, 
in the form of the urge for pursuit of pleasure through sex act. And this act has been abused, misused so much that an animal and a human being can literally become animal in so-called advanced countries, I have seen that. So, now, the feeling, the pursuit of pleasure and pursuit of pain, and the pursuit of equanimity, these three feelings, if you understand them, you have understood indeed yourself very much. And when you have understood yourself, you have understood the world. And when you have understood yourself and the world, you have become master of yourself. You are your Lord. You don't need any, you don't need to create any gods to be your Lord. You are your Lord, you are your Master. You have complete control over your feelings and through that over your mind. And by having complete control, you become enlightened. You become Master of, master of all. You have transcended all. Your mind is transformed from the state of milk to the state of ghee. It will never revert. So now, having understood this, that feeling has such tremendous significance in changing life. It's worthwhile that every seeker of truth subjugates himself or herself to the study of feeling to do research over your feeling, to know yourself. The only way you can know yourself is by knowing your feeling. There is no other way. To begin with, there is no self at all. 